Well, uh, welcome again, everybody. Welcome to this final session of our two-day symposium on decolonizing histories in South Africa. My name is, for people who have just joined us, my name is Wayne Dooling, and I'm a member of the Department of History here at SOAS. And um, today, this afternoon, our final session is a keynote conversation between two of South Africa's uh, preeminent historians, and one is an historian and an anthropologist, but our two speakers today, a keynote conversation around the theme of forensic museology, restitution and archive. Our two speakers, firstly, we'll have Carolyn Hamilton, who is an anthropologist and an historian. Carolyn is currently a National Research Foundation professor at the University of Cape Town in archive and public culture. Most of us historians uh, probably know Carolyn best for her book, very big book, Terrific Majesty, The Powers of Shaka Zulu and the Limits of Invention. Uh, Carolyn will be in conversation with Siraj Rasul. Siraj is a professor of uh, history in the, in the Department of History at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town. Many people don't know this, but Siraj's earliest work was on the life and times of the unity movement leader, I.B. Tabata. Um, and, but the reason many of us don't know this is because Siraj has moved so firmly to the area of heritage and memorial studies, as well as being involved in the mobilization for the repatriation of the remains of African bodies to South Africa. He's published very widely in this field and collaborated with a number of scholars in South Africa and the wider world. And most recent publications include The Politics of Heritage in Africa, another volume called Unsettled History, The Making of South African Public Pasts. So thank you both uh, Siraj and Carolyn for joining us today. Um, the format that we've settled on is that Carolyn will speak first um, and engage Siraj in conversation on our uh, set theme. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Wayne. Uh, so uh, I suppose unlike the other panelists, which the other um, keynote conversations which seem to have uh, someone drawing someone else out, uh, Siraj and I have realized that we have to prompt each other and uh, get the engagement going like that. So I thought I would kick off by asking Siraj about the concept that he proposed as the title for um, our session which is that of forensic museology. Now, um, I think it'd be great for the purposes of the symposium to go through what you mean by forensic museology and also perhaps open up to the audience and so on to see whether we can stretch it or, or, or do even more things with it um, and whether it's got some limits. So I'm interested in the term because Forensics really is a term that um, has its greatest uh, application in criminalistics, one way or another. Um, and you sort of the term across into museology. And we, uh, it has a quite an electric and challenging effect when one does a jump like that. And in fact, we know that that kind of jumping from one field, taking an idea from one field and jumping it into the other field often disturbs fundamentally the assumptions of the receiving field. It has that, that sort of wonderful effect um, of being able to expose certain assumptions in the receiving field. So I wanted you to talk um, a little bit to that and to talk to it as, a, as I understand it to be a tactic of, with a disruptive effect. But then I wanted to push you and to say, and then what's behind the tactic? Because, um, as we all know, having a bit of a shared political background back in the day, uh, tactics always have to be underpinned by strategies. And what is the strategy, the methodological and the critical strategy that is enabled by the tactic? So that's the kind of question that I would love to see you kick us off with. And then perhaps we might go on to rest and the possible stretching of the term. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thanks to Wayne and Kai and other colleagues for this um, amazing two days of discussion. Um, and for people who, who know my work, who've been following the trajectory of my work, you will know that 
uh, one of my main interests is in transforming the concept of the museum that we have from one that's rooted in governmentality, a 19th century uh, museum that is about the classificatory order of collections. Um, and that, that, that works with an assumption of care and of um, humanitarianism. And, um, you know, th that is work that I've done in South Africa, uh, sometimes in conversation with Carolyn and other colleagues about how you transform a legacy of the ethnographic in a democratizing society and what the future of the ethnographic in the museum might be uh, in post in a in a in the in the decolonial project or in the anti-colonial project if you like um, and obviously this is a discussion about disciplines it's a discussion about uh, disciplines in different societies in different colonial histories and so we have Germany which never had uh, which never faced national liberation struggles and which have completely untransformed disciplines and where for the purposes of our discussion uh, 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 hosted partly by SOAS, it's important for us to note that the, the, the holus bolus way in which we use the idea of Western actually doesn't work. Uh, the, the African history doesn't exist in Germany. So there, there are different strategies and tactics uh, in, in different societies, in, in different situations. So I've, my work on human remains, restitution, I feel fortunate to have been able to take that from having discovered the evidence of the modern museum rooted in stolen human remains from the Northern Cape uh, in, the, in, in the South African Museum at the beginning of the 20th century, in the formation of the McGregor Museum, in the competition uh, that occurred at the beginning of the 20th century with European uh, 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 anthropologists and institutions in the South Africanization of science and in making an argument for restitution of the dead and thinking about the dead, not as collections, but as ancestors, especially since our archive has enabled us to name the dead and to, to, to think about restitution right through to being part of negotiations in um, of helping shape a negotiate uh, a, a, a restitution as one based on rehumanization and thinking about that concept in relation to systematic forms of dehumanization so this is work that um, we're very fortunate to have done right through to reburial and now also being able to identify more uh, sets of human remains and name them that uh, are in Austrian collections and being able to work with colleagues and identify South African human remains in Germany and so forth and working with advising the Germans on their restitution of human remains to, to Rwanda and to elsewhere in, 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 in Africa and to work out precisely that the extent to which in our collections, in collections in Germany, collections in Austria, the extent to which human remains have been removed from and separated from uh, material culture. Whereas in fact, very often, those human remains and material culture sound recordings were collected as part of the same field expeditions. So I'm saying for part of the same uh, collecting expeditions uh, as part of uh, the same research projects and unfortunately, those that places human remains and, and material culture into the same equation. So it's, it's been easier for us to think of uh, the, the presence of human remains in museums of culture as unacceptable. And it's becoming now widely accepted in Germany and elsewhere that restitution shall take place. But we still maintain a kind of framework of care for material culture and for the ethnographic, whereas we are learning just the extent to which museums are not, we're not just beneficiaries of colonial violence, but we're implicated in the very acts of violence themselves, we're embedded in colonial, in expeditions of conquest. Um, and so, you know, this is emerging from, this is a, like in the Sa Savoir report, you have it in the, in the book that's just come out by Dan Hicks, 
and for colleagues there's a conversation that a number of us uh, have with Dan Hicks that's just come out literally an hour ago in the British Art Journal so colleagues can download that uh, that explains this concept of forensic museology just very briefly I'm very fortunate to work with a team of scholars in my department who have been developing this field of forensic history, who've been dealing with the kind of post wars of the dead in relation to the dead of apartheid violence, the, 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 the dead, the, 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 the murdered, the mutilated, and in, on, in the recovery of the dead body of, 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 of the violence of apartheid. And we have all, we've made a case for putting these different categories of the dead into the same discussion as the remains of, mis of the missing, as the remains of, of ancestors, and the, of, of, of the remains, of, the remains of, of, of human beings. And so the concept of the forensic that we work with, yes, it does have its origins in a legal concept, in an evidentiary concept. And, you know, people, some people don't know this, but I'm a lawyer by training, and I got trained in forensic medicine. And so I, you know, these are big, these are things that I, I, I went through uh, myself in, in, in legal cases around violence, around killing, around deaths. And, and um, but we've also listened to the, the scholarship that's come out and the activism that's come out of forensic architecture, engaged with that a little bit. And we accept that the idea of the forensic is more powerful than simply the deeply empirical. The idea of the forensic opens up the idea of the forum and of social inquiry, of spaces of social inquiry, spaces of dissent and spaces of questioning. And that is the concept of the museum that I am putting forward strategically, a new concept of museum that's not rooted on the care of collections. In fact, what I've argued is that restitution itself becomes the basis of a new museology. So then, if I may, um, Siraj, the, um, I see that we've got a great question already up in the Q&A, which is asking about the matter of categorization. And this is where I thought maybe you and I in conversation and with the participants in the, in the discussion could stretch the meaning of forensic because you've put forensic very squarely in the area of human remains and, um, and restitution. But prompted by this uh, rather great first question, for the forensic in the museology doesn't have to be limited, of course, to the question of the human remains. And what does it mean to think about the forensic in relation to the ethnographic, which you mentioned? Now, I'm very alert to the fact that in the, the forensic, in forensics in general, there's a lot of debate and the fingerprint debates, the classic one, it appears to be the clean, scientific, absolutely validated procedure of forensics. But in fact, there's an enormous debate among scientists about whether the fingerprint is in fact start to think about these questions of categories and what happens when we start being forensic around the categories that would seem to suggest that we have to look very closely at the procedures and protocols of the museum itself so that those sorts of things can become one of the objects of our forensic inquiry which means then we want to track a set of fingerprints, actually, of all the curatorial hands that have touched the items with which we are concerned. Because we know, and this goes back to an, uh, a point raised in an earlier panel, that the object that is constituted as the museum object is a transformed object. It's not the same object that it was when it was in circulation in, um, in, in social life. And in fact, it's been transformed and changed all through the time that it's been in the so-called preservatory institution. Uh, by so-called, of course, I recognize there is huge preservation going on. It doesn't mean there's inertia or that the object is frozen in time. So there's all that 
forensics that's possible in relation to the museum. So I would, I would, um, I'd want us to consider that, especially in relation to that first question. Absolutely. Um, and these are matters that have concerned us now for many years, as we have uh, tried to think about the life of objects and collections in museums in more complex ways, and to think about all the entire life and the, the journeys that objects have made. And, and there are some be there are beautiful exhibitions um, about that, that, is also, that have also along the way question the way that um, objects and artworks have come to be uh, come to be classified and so the the beautiful um, uh, exhibition on Senufo art that was done by uh, Gagliardi and uh, uh, Petridis uh, a couple of years ago uh, moved along those lines and just questioned the category of Senufo, perhaps the most powerful work about West Africa that I align with the work that you and Nessa Liebhammer have done on tribing and untribing. But I think also that those frameworks that we've had of looking for the complexity of the object in the, in the museum have also sometimes fallen into the trap of a neo-colonial position. And this is the neo-colonial position that you see in the response of Nick Thomas to the Sa Savoy report. And it's, but it, it is also a position that I think comes directly out of the practice of um, uh, collections management and uh, the history of collecting in the Pacific. The very particular kind of politics of collecting in which they have made the most powerful arguments for co-curatorship and shared collections and thinking about the object as more complex. Here, I think on the African continent, we are dealing with certain things. We are dealing with incomplete sovereignty. You're dealing with the, the, the entrapment, the colonial entrapment of the ethnographic museum in which African people do not recognize themselves. And yet they have these beautiful artifacts that need to be given life in a new relationship with the people so that people can, can, can see themselves in the museums and in their relationship with these, these objects. And that presents a new opportunity. And it's more than just changing the label. I mean, you and I spent a beautiful afternoon together in the Koninklijke Museum uh, in Leiden where you know in that museum they have they had this problem of what do you do what do you do south africans with our labels which we call kaffir how can you help us change that uh, and so the the process of authentication of the object is not what this project should be about this is a project that has to turn to i mean these museums have got to seek a new authority outside of the colonial framework that enabled them to become the custodians and the owners, if you like, of those, those artifacts. And so, yes, I think that there is work that we need to do, which is about the meaning of the object, the relationship of the object with people, the relationship of the object with the dead. There, 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 there is an exciting world, I think, ahead of us with a completely different concept of the museum that is not rooted in a narrow framework of the care for collections for future generations, and that is not trapped in the categories and the disciplines that were granted to us by colonialism, that we've, begun, we've changed substantially in certain universities in certain countries, but where in the museum they've been left largely untouched. So then, uh, uh, Siraj, I would agree with your um, critique of uh, co-curation. I would also, I want to throw in the observation that I'm aware that um, African scholars are constantly being asked somehow to give the new label, somehow to authorize the transformation of the museum. 
sometimes even to um, exorcise the past out of the museum, particularly through the introduction of artworks and so on. And when I make the point about tracking the fingerprints, it's not for the purposes of authenticating the object. It's actually for the purposes of exposing the colonial logic of the categorization so that one can see how it comes into place. But I'm wondering whether scholars like ourselves and our many students and our associates want to be part, actively part of the project of transforming these European museums. Or do we want to be an enabling of a set of other projects? And I'm extremely, um, I, I really loved Ashiel's phrase where he talked about at this moment where we are epistemically that curiosity and experimentation is the absolute thing that we have to underwrite and support. And I'm not at all certain that museums can experiment at the edge of what they have to do. I think they are in many ways subjected or imagine they are subjected to all kinds of pressures. And I have a sense that young curators want to go to all sorts of other edges. So the question then is, what does it take to follow those fingerprints so that you actually know what, how the thing became constituted as the museum thing that it now is so as to be able to critique that and unlock it from that. But also, how do you release that object for all sorts of other kinds of engagements? Perhaps of the kind that would raise the hair on the back of the neck of the museum director. But I think it is a time of experimentation. And I would then say that leads me to the kind of work that we've been most interested in, in the 500 year archive which has been what happens if you take the material that's been stuck in ethnographic categorization and say, this stuff is not representative of a people and ethnicity, a whatever the category is that the museum put on it. It's stuff that's in a museum and it came to be there by particular circumstances and a whole lot of other stuff didn't come to be there. And the circumstances of why that stuff got there and the other stuff didn't is of course of interest. But now it's a, it can be taken out and used for all sorts of other purposes. And at its best, that's what an archive is. Is that a, a, an archive imagines a place that somehow ended up with some stuff and you can go to it and make of it what you will. It's, it, the implication is that you come back again and again. It is the forum, which I think you're right. For it, I mean, forensics, you know, the term does come etymologically from forum. So you're meant to come back again and again, not just in the next 10 years, but over the next couple hundred years. So where stuff stays in any repository, what does it take to enable it to be treated as archive? But also, and I think this is absolutely crucial, what are the limits of the inherited, it's essentially a 19th century European concept of archive that has been visited upon us in other parts of the world? Because that's a concept of archive that imagines the archive is unchanging. And those documentary sources, which are the imagined object of the archive are not unchanging. They are also subject to all sorts of filtering, shaping and reshaping over time. So if we are, if part of our exercise forensically is to treat those objects archivally, we also have to stretch the concept of archive. Not only do we have to stretch the concept of forensic, but we'd have to stretch the concept of archive to do a whole lot of things that it needs to do in a 21st century when it's not the concept of archive that Ranker put in place and that came, was visited upon us through colonial bureaucracy. I'll stop there for the moment. Yeah, your, your concept of archive is very exciting because yours is not simply the concept of the historian, uh, where the historian, you know, enters the picture as this is my site of research, where I'm going to make discoveries and where they are, where these archives are in disarray or in danger of, 
of, of crumbling and of, of disappearing, that their responsibility is to, is to, uh, is to go through a, a preservation exercise, usually framed as the, the rescue project of digitization and so forth. That is fine. But, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, I, as, as you would imagine, um, I would argue for a much closer association between archive and museum as similar collecting institutions, as, as, as similar kind of, that these are institutions of, 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 of the constitution of citizenship. Um, and, 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 and the concept of citizenship, and I'm going to use a Carolyn Hamilton term now, the concept of citizenship is that we talk about is not a convened citizenship. It is a citizenship that encourages disagreement and it encourages questioning. And unfortunately, that is a citizenship that is that is you know potentially regarded as dangerous in in, in many societies because because I mean our our you know South Africa is such a commemorative state in which we you know people we, all we know is to arrive and to be to be compliant. And we, we, we have this, you know, our, our rituals of, 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 uh, of state making and citizenship are so based on obedience and, and, and on gathering as in, in, in orderly ways. And I'm, I'm afraid, you know, what, what, what we are talking about is a citizenship of disruption, where the disruption is, is a necessary process. And, and the, 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 we have to disrupt the order of these institutions in order for them to be meaningful, in order for them to, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, Achille's idea of curiosity, ideas of curiosity and experimentation is exactly what is required. And this is the new generation, and this is what we, this is, this is what we have to go. We, where we have to go, and you know, I've been thinking, you know, in our preparation, just about how important archive is in this discussion. Just thinking of the work that has been done on the migrated archives that were secreted away, and that were British government was forced to bring them to light, not just for Kenya in the case of the 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 legal case, and we yeah, yeah I'm reminded of the fantastic work of of the beautifully named Museum of British Colonialism that you know uses that material and that does a digital mapping of of uh, of, of of Mau Mau camps and and so forth but you know your work I think your work on on um, on archive as something that we do as something that we that that we don't just go to it we do it and we and we do it in certain ways and we we do it as a kind of politics of knowledge i think opens up a different concept of of archive for us i wonder whether you can take that prompt well i will but i see we've also got a great question i don't know if you've seen it in the um q a from Illyria. And she's sort of saying, I hate to paraphrase someone else's question, but please do or read it. But I take, I take it from her question that she's saying, well, actually do the kind of reckoning that you're asking for. And then she sort of suggests, so does this mean we need a new kind of museum? And I, the minute you brought the word forensics into our conversation, I, it did occur to me that we know the word forensics, forensic most, uh, it's most familiar to us in relation to the corpse. And I do wonder if the museum is an institution for the 21st century or the museum as we know it, which is the museum, which has a twin capacity one which is that 19th century capacity of putting forward knowledge in some sort of form into the public domain, actually authorizing knowledge, or whether it, it's a repository aspect is really the stronger aspect. Because the fact of the matter is now, the digital curation can be done by anyone, 
if you have a access to these items um, in digital form, you can curate them how you want to in digital form. Of course, and I think that this was a point made um, um, earlier about the real thing has somehow its own powers that want to be explored in the in physical reality. And indeed, I'm, I'm sure that that is the case. But nonetheless, I think there's a tremendous um, space of experimentation. But it does worry me that if we don't watch those fingerprints and if we don't keep our eye on one thing that is strongest in archival practice, and that is watching where, how the object got collected, we sometimes forget that these objects which occupy such a big space are already being pre-selected to survive, to be the ones that survive when all the others were selected out. And the last comment I wanted to throw in here is, of course, the very division archive and museum is one of those colonial categories that we want to resist, surely, because yep. it's a division that has been so dangerous. Um, and in resisting it, it's not to favor one above the other, but to understand that both come with an apparatus that we might want to look very critically at. As soon as one does, as some of, uh, some of the scholars um, in my uh, group do, as soon as you start trying to work and think about the past before colonialism, you're stuck in a space that historically has been described as the archivist space. And then the next move was, oh, well, maybe it does have an archive of sorts called oral tradition. Creation of all of these categories, oral tradition, archive, set up as though the one has something that the other one doesn't have, a lack. Turns out, if you sit on that edge and look critically from that margin of the discipline, because who goes to study the past before colonialism? Very few scholars. It's the outer outline margin, but perhaps a really powerful interrogative one. Then you suddenly think, hang on a second. Maybe I don't accept the inherited idea of archive or the inherited idea of old tradition. Why are these things pulled apart into these kind of categories? Don't they share certain custodial different, but, but they both have custodial imperatives and they both change, actually. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this was the lifeblood of our training in the, the kind of post Vancina kind of era of, of being inculcated into a discipline that had to reckon with the spoken word, that had to be open to uh, what we called in the old days non-written sources, but which obviously we, we think of in more complex ways today. Um, and to, you know, it, it, it's amazing what happens as I had to do a few years ago, not being able to go into Britain any longer as I pleased, I shifted my focus to a much easier visa regime area of Germany, where as a professor, I get a long-term visa, et cetera. Um, and to, to shift into a non-English speaking environment and into a German environment where you have such a different history of disciplines, a history of, 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 of the museum, and so forth, and you discover that, quite frankly, I mean, I mean, they, okay, they also have the concept of prehistory, right? And they also have the concept of proto-history. So they are very clear about what makes the cut of history. And let me tell you, and even those scholars of ours who work on in in what they call African history, you know, at Berlin and so forth, they actually do not work in African history. They work in the field of German history in Africa. So they are imperial historians, if you like. And they, they, none of them have to face the possibility of voice as archive and the challenge of orality in all of its manifestations. Um, and so you, you, you actually realize how revolutionary it was to have studied African history. 
you know, how revolutionary it was that places like SOAS, you know, these fields of study developed at a certain point, not accidentally. There's a reason why at a certain point uh, in Britain, in some institutions, you know, in some in, in, in African universities that developed in the 60s and so forth, why these developments took place. And, and I tell, tell my German colleagues, you want to really make a, a dramatic change in your university. You close down your department of Africanistic, which in German is not like what we call African studies. And you appoint African historians into the department of history. And you, you, you work with the concept of history and historicization that is outside of this narrow Frankian documentary empirical political history kind of concept and it's a it's it's you know so so decolonization of course we know all the ways that how decolonization can be gentrified how it can be turned into a discussion or how it's been appropriated when people simply mean diversity and so forth but they are fun when you think of it as disciplinary and epistemic there are certain moves that can be made in the museum and in the university. And what makes museums and archives so compelling is that they are part, they are academic institutions, they're marked by disciplines, they have disciplinary struggles going on inside of them. They are knowledge institutions, they, they, they work with uh, 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 epistemic worlds and so forth, but they're also public institutions. Their relationship with publics is potentially different. Universities are so trapped in an outreach concept and in a public, public appreciation of science and this and that, that kind of notion of publics, of, of the grateful public for the scholarship is not one that is productive for, uh, for um, I suppose, for, for critical citizenship. So on this question of publicness, Siraj, let me um, bore us all with the discussion of computer software. Because actually, we have to watch out for the software itself and what it forces. When we started out to try with what was really a political project, a political intellectual project to insist on an archive for let's say the 500 years before colonialism. We wanted to do it digitally and we wanted to make it sustainable. So we used a open source software, the gold standard archival open source software developed by the Canadians and it's got all these wonderful standards and so on. One of the most extraordinary things about it is it has no capacity for public engagement. So it's impossible. It has, it has no imagining of the public, the public presentation. It does, first of all, it doesn't imagine the public's going to use it because it's quite complex and difficult to use. It's really, I suppose, essentially starts as an archival management system. So it's difficult to go and find the thing that you're looking for using the software. But you can't ever engage it. You can't ever add to it. You can't comment on it. You can't do anything unless the archivists who are the custodians let you somehow into the system. So there's no place. There's no place for being able to engage the archive. So it's a, again, it's again one of those divisions. So somehow the archive, the only way you can engage the archive is to go research and then publish. But in fact, this division between the archive and the publication, which happens somewhere else and used to be in a book, is now in one space, which is the digital space. There's nothing to stop you putting up your publication and having an archival link right there that clicks to the very thing that you're talking about, if it's digitally available. And then that leads us to some fantastic questions because who's controlling what's available in what form digitally is a really tricky question. And if you can't engage 
the format and the organization or the error or the whatever, then you've got, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult, I think. Um, so just to say then, you know, if we are imagining all sorts of ways of releasing things from museums, we have to think very carefully about even something like the software because it's so it's got these knowledge categories these procedures and protocols that come from way back absolutely embedded in in them and it's very authorizing in in particular ways so it's a big battle as it turns out by the way if you try and tinker with the open source software you then have to start paying like mad to maintain your little changes like if you introduce a public forum or something of that nature. Can I just um, can I just jump in and but I've started to to some of the questions uh, that we have in the Q and A. So I'll I'll just paraphrase or try and bring together some of the questions that appear in our Q and A box. But there have been a couple of questions that in a sense speak to redeeming. And one person asked specifically, how can the museum be redeemed? Um, and there was another question which I think is related, and we can bring those two together. There was a question of as to whether we can cite specific examples of uh, museum practice on the continent, on the African continent. And I guess the person, the, the, the thought behind that question is do we have specific examples of museums that have been redeemed in some way? Um, and I, Sarah, I don't know, you, in a sense, you, you spoke to that to some extent when you, you had a kind of throwaway line in, uh, when you spoke earlier, you had a throwaway line that said one of the things that museums should do is uh, be spaces uh, in which people can recognize themselves. And I suppose that's part of the answer towards this question of, of redeeming. And my own question, which I'll latch onto that is so, you know, how do we, um, so if we do create museums in which people recognize themselves, how do we stop those places from simply becoming places about people seeing themselves? So, you know, a museum in which I know you've been involved is the district, a classic example is the District 6 Museum, which you've been involved. So how do we stop the District 6 Museum from simply becoming that colored museum? Um, you know, is a, a phrase that I've heard. Um, so I wonder if you could just uh, comment on that. And then I had a question for Carolyn. Um, Carolyn, you said you want to see the archive and the museum being, you know, or at least you, 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 you want to see that separation being closed down or, or dismembered. And I, I wondered how that sat with um, the archive as a place where historians actually go and do archival work um, and a museum being something rather different. I'll end there. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I've been looking at the quite some very interesting questions from uh, all the colleagues and um, um, I mean, and I'll just go through through some of them. Yeah, I mean, renaming it belongs to this discussion. Um, you know, it, it it's something that 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 is necessary, something that 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 happens. It's in the ordinary course of 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 remaking a society such as South Africa, um, and just like there there were these renamings, um, you know, centuries ago, and and so forth. Um, I suppose the, the issue that, that I think needs to be thought about is that that process is trapped in a kind of a system of committees of naming and geographies and place names and so forth. And it's done in the orderly fashion of governmentality. And that's, that, that's fine. But um, the, 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 the museology that I'm talking about is an inculcation of practices not simply by expert curators that is a practice of museum with the people you know it it you 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 see it far more far more of these possibilities in latin america um, you know i was very fortunate to to get to spend time in brazil and colombia um, uh, and on a unesco thing where the, the Brazilians and other Latin Americans were, you know, putting pressure on ICOM, putting pressure on UNESCO to change the concept of a museum. Uh, and, and these were museums like the Musée de Marais in, in Rio de Janeiro, which is just a stone's throw away from the Porto de Valongo, where 
you know, uh, human remains of slaves were discovered in the preparation for for the World Cup there and so forth. It's it's uh, and the Eco Museo de Amazonia. These are these are deployments of the idea of the museum for different purposes, for purposes of of gathering, of building uh, resilience and self respect. And of you know sometimes they are memorial museums. So memorial museums become the 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 way in which uh, that you can in a sense redeem the museum. The work that happens at uh, at my 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 colleague um, uh, uh, Nelson Abiti does in at the National Museum of of Uganda of of utilizing the 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 crusty ethnographic dusty collections for the purposes of social healing in in sections of Ugandan society that have experienced mass violence and that go through community discussions and where these artifacts are brought out. So you get a, a very different set of possibilities that I think move beyond the ethnographic, that move beyond you know the old work that is still in the museum on the peopling of Africa and you know this race and that tribe and so forth. Um, so yes, um, and then the 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 question of reparations, of course, you cannot exclude reparations from the discussion. If you if you follow all of the research, uh, um, you know, on the on the commission that repaid owners of enslaved people uh, in Britain pertaining to in, uh, slavery in the Caribbean. South Africa, Mauritius, uh, when you follow that forensically, if you like, then you are talking about a, reparate, a reparatory framework that needs to be brought into the equation. Uh, we, we, we can understand that when you follow the debates in the United States. I think it's, the situation is, 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 is beautifully poised for reparations to, to take on uh, very important meanings for us, of course, with the TRC experience, we know that uh, symbolic reparations is a very important part of this of this work. And the, what the ideas that we are talking about belongs to the framework of symbolic reparations, uh, if you like. In, in other words, where, 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 it, where we work with a concept of social justice in the general sense and not just uh, you know, transitional justice, um, and and um, you know, my my longtime colleague uh, Paul Basu, of course, asks a very challenging question. And of course, I have no doubt that co-curatorship, uh, collaboration, and dialogue are very important projects that museums need to undertake. That you you see that in the work recently done in the Pitt Rivers Museum. Uh, you 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 see that in Iziko, um, it, and 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 you see that in work that that happens in the District Six Museum all the time, um, and the 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 problem is that one cannot leave the matter there, that that is not the end point, that that is not the the form. and 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 quite frankly, if you read the intellectual response. You know, if you and and I've been in conferences recently where where Nick Thomas's ideas get hauled out in his presence and get paraded for anti restitution purposes, and and he gets up and he says, "I'm sorry, that's not what I meant." Now, if you read, if you read that article, the most articulate argument against restitution that says, "No, no, no, we've actually have we have a a, a much more a much more powerful toolkit." To transform the museum, and we've been doing it for many years. We loan, uh, we we work with indigenous people to 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 co-curate and so forth. But quite frankly, you know, left just to that, uh, you have a problem, especially when you are talking about artifacts that have a foundation in violent in the violence of acquisition. Um, and and it's 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 not that one is wanting to redeem the museum, that one is wanting to clean the museum, sterilize it from all of this this terrible history uh, and terrifying history. 
it's that we are we are wanting a very new concept of the museum we are not wanting to reform the museum we want a museum revolution and then i'll, I'll respond to wayne i suppose um I guess I think your question is, isn't the art, aren't the archives the place where the historians go to work? Is perhaps a question that um, worries me. Now, why does it worry me? Because does it suggest then that the museum is not an archive where historians go to work? So, or is it, does it sort of imply, well, okay, well, that's fine, the art historians can go there because uh, they like to look at a few things. But I think if we try and split the archive and the museum, the archives and the museums like that, we're forgetting the extent to which some things got consigned to the one place and other things got consigned and framed differently in the other place. You have to be able to bring the two together and subject them, I think, to the same procedures. Because if you don't, we carry on investing in a, an idea that the, these that somehow the written document is some is, is quite a different sort of object from these other stored objects but they're all stored objects selected and stored objects procedures of a certain kind made those particular things the subject or the object i suppose of the repository's attention and not other things and only sometimes by going to the other place do you see what the one the exclusions in the other. And that goes to that original point about jumping field. Because if you don't jump field, you can't escape the colonial categorization. You, you know, you're just locked into the colonial logic. So the field jumping, whether it's crossing mediums, whether it's reconvening, something that um, Siraj mentioned, where you bring, bring back stuff that got separated, uh, where you move from the one authoritative category, the museum, into the other authoritative uh, category, um, archive and you crisscross backwards and forwards taking your concepts with you from the one place to the other to ensure mutual interrogation is one way of collapsing those silos from within and some of the congealed categories of knowledge that have been such an epistemic trap all of these things I think are actually experiments we're on the I think a, a, a cusp a cusp of epistemic rupture really and that's why I wonder whether the museum as we know it is not actually dead. Yeah, you know, and that something else is going to have to come forward because I can't really see, and well, I can't see the intellectual interest in a lot of the redeeming activity. I can see the extraordinary value of the things that are in museums some of which will never be the subject of even a restitution demand. Some of those things people don't want back, don't need back. Some of them are too quotidian, but all sorts of things. But they are, you know, they're, they're, some of the things, I mean, what about our, our museums in South Africa, which are national custodians for a national archival and um, an, uh, uh, a physical uh, estate? You know, the stuff is home, but it's just as surely trapped in the museum as it is when it's uh, in a in a in some place abroad. So I'm I'm wary of of um, imagining that work the historians work in archives. I think historians, not just art historians, historians work effectively on intellectual history powerfully when they go into museums to look at what's happened to stuff in museums, to see what museums do. I think ethnographically, it's very interesting not to look at the ethnographic collections for what they've got to say about the culture of people imagined as tribal people, but actually for the museum culture, because sure, it is a culture just as surely as any other culture. It's a European culture in particular. And an ethnographic lens on it shows it up as full of the culture, the, the, the values and norms of a particular culture. So uh, those would be my thoughts. I'm very keen on collapsing these distinctions as firmly as possible. 
Thank you, Caroline. We've got um, we've got a couple of couple, couple more questions. Um, there's a question from um, uh, well, the person doesn't give their name, but there's a question that says the Australian Aborigine that remains in Cambridge are subject of repatriation. Yet scholars continue to research on them, reasoning they'd rather take data before they are gone. Is there a prevailing ethical standard being followed in museums and university laboratories? Um, I'm not sure that's addressed at any one person, but I wondered if either of you wanted to comment. Um, you know, it's these are this is a common practice when you get to spend a lot of time in museums. I mean, I about five years ago, I was with my colleague uh, uh, Paul Turnbull in the anatomy museum at the University of Cologne. And Paul is, of course, one of the leading scholars on restitution of uh, indigenous Australian remains. And one of the authors, one of the editors on some of the major texts on restitution and repatriation. Um, and I you know, witnessed his realization of what Australian remains were in those um, were in the collection of that anatomy museum. And it's it, it, it happens all it happens all the time. Uh, it, it, it is because because um, and especially you know society like uh, Germany, you know they, they've had other other stuff to to deal with, and so suddenly this stuff is all coming out of the closet, and they and you know they 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 realize the extent to which all their subsequent twentieth century violences might have an an origin somewhere else in another collecting history, and that's not you know imposing a kind of um, a, a conspiratorial framework on this begat that and that begat the other violence. Um, and that, that just uh, is a certain genealogy that an argument has been made for. And, uh, and so, um, but, you know, certainly in, in Germany, especially with an active uh, Australian government, you, you have uh, a, a restitution program. Of course, in South African collections, we also have Australian remains, uh, remains of indigenous people, and which obviously means that um, that our scientists were sharing collections. So, you know, we we, we went through a, 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 a process of of up to a certain point of doing the provenance and finding collections in Kimberley and Cape Town. And, to, you know, this was being prepared for restitution at a certain point and then got interrupted because, you know, governments lose their memory. It's a terrible thing when you get a new minister, you get a new staff, because the, this, this involves, it's difficult practical work. It's like implementing restitution, implementing a restitution program like the New Zealanders do where they, they hand the entire program over to uh, Te Papa Museum on behalf of the state and on behalf of indigenous people. Because there you have a different history of sovereignty and how we name these things as restitution and repatriation and when we use what term and when we use both and so forth. Because And, and restitution, I think, means to become our term because it involves a claim. And, 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 and really a lot of our effort needs to go into, um, into building capacities to make claims, to work with governments to make claims. We have an incoming uh, African Union uh, uh, president who has put restitution high up on his agenda, which unfortunately uh, Ramaphosa didn't during his, during his term. And you know what this is going to mean for every country is very important. You know, Sa Savoir applies mainly. That is mainly about Francophone West Africa, and it. We need to work out what what it means in different countries, and it's a uh, and it's very important that this be done, that this thinking be done, because restitution will fail if it is simply a program of European 
gift making. Uh, it, 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 it reproduces the problem. And, and so, and yes, I mean, I was listening to some of this discussion yesterday, you know, people were worried about the framework of the nation. Of course, you know, that, that is, that is a problem. But let me tell you, in Germany, they, they had other problems at a certain point of the development of their human remains policy that I, you know, had to comment on at a certain point, because the German colleagues thought that it's up to individual German museums to verify the authenticity of claimants and to go through a program of museum, but of each local museum going through restitution themselves. And, you know, the South Africans are clear, this is a state to state competence the national government competence, but it can't be just that. It has to be in association with local communities. And, you know, and, and obviously we cannot simply have the monumental museum as in Ajay is making in Benin, as we have in uh, Dakar, as is being created in Algeria, supported by the African Union. You can't have the monumental museum as the as the model in the answer to that old European chestnut that Africans don't know how to look after objects they don't have the capacity so you know so along with the new concept of museum must come what do we mean by restitution because restitution cannot be understood as events management restitution is not an event rest you know unfortunately our Namibian colleagues the Namibian government knows how to do events management. So yeah, it's not an event. We need to, we, this is going to be with us for another generation. This is a new opportunity for us to rethink what we mean by museum. Wayne, would you allow me to come in on one other point? You know, there's um, uh, one of the questions that were put to us in the, the q and A is what about the post COVID museum and it does prompt a very big point because if we think that the discussion today is about the past i think we're missing the point because everything that we've got to say here about these information data material holding institutions archives and museums really 19th century data repositories of a certain kind these questions are being blown out of the water by what's happening to data today. So it's not just about looking backwards to think about what happened in the past in relation to the data which constitutes what becomes the knowledge of the world. It's very much, and I think again, I think um, Ashil touched on this. It's very much about taking some of our insights about what's happened in the past to understand what's happening, to the way in which that data is being organized and preserved now and where it is and how the categories are working. We have to learn the lesson that who controls the organization of the data controls what is going to become knowledge. And so the politics of this, it's almost as though these deep and painful questions are just a learning experience to try and understand the huge power of the threat that faces us. And I think that does take us back to Ashil's talk where we're saying, have to think about the future that we're heading into with every possible critical tool and faculty we have to understand where we're going. So thanks to the person who gave that great question. Thank you very much, Carolyn. We need, we need to draw things to a close. There was a, I'll just um, to two points. One, one, I mean, absolutely, Carolyn, I couldn't agree more with you in the last, the last point you made, but I'd also like to remind us of a point, a uh, very good point that Elsie Wusu made yesterday and the point that she made about museums and restoration and collection was that, you know, it's, that a lot of it is actually fairly mundane, that there's just quite a lot of ordinary donkey work that needs to be done <laughs> around issues of categorization and um, cataloging and so forth. Um, you know, very, very basic things um, was, was the point that she made. And I thought that was really, very, very important one that got lost. I mean, it's, you know, one could make the same point 
when you speak, I mean, so I spoke a few minutes ago about, you know, issues of slave restitution and so forth. Um, you know, one, one can make the same point around, uh, if you're thinking about um, issues of slavery and restitution. And so, you know, in the South African case, the um, obvious example was the kind of issue of slave compensation payments that were paid to former slave owners. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've read um, in papers, I, I can't tell you how many times I've read people saying, uh, yes, you know, we absolutely, this, this would be very good to know if we actually did the work, and, you know, but, the, you know, this, this would be a good thing to do, but nobody actually does it. <laughs> it's only very recently, only very recently that people have kind of, you know, cataloged um, slave compensation payments in the Cape Colony, for example. And UCL, of course, led the field in, in Britain um, with regards to trying to catalogue slave owner wealth. But let me, let, let's draw things to a close because we have five minutes between the end of the session and the start of our next session, which is the closing remarks by, uh, by two speakers, by Andrea and by the lady. So thank, I, I thank you very much, both Siraj and Carolyn, for an incredibly stimulating talk. And as I'm not saying that myself simply, but many, many people in the comments have said that. So thank you very much for participating. And please do stay for our closing remarks to members of the audience. And we'll see you in just a minute. Thank you so much. Um, Angelica, do we have a new, is the, will the closing remarks be in the same session or uh, Yes, um, I'd still like to uh, welcome um, uh, Professor Andra Cornwall and uh, Professor Rile Bonile Mulitani. Uh, uh, they are going now to um, give us the closing remark. Um, I also would like, uh, yes, the convener of the conference, Wayne, Duli, Mahesh Naidu, and Kaisten. Uh, perhaps you want to turn your video off as well and take part in, in the closing remark at the convenience of the conference. And uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone. And I now, um, I pass it on to Andrea uh, to start off with some closing remarks from the SOAS University of London. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica. And thank you, everybody um, who is involved in organising this extraordinary event. It was so fascinating, such a rich programme. Um, I think so many important issues uh, that have been addressed, but also, as I can see and hear, so much commonality between our institutions. Uh, so much there in terms of potential shared projects for the future, shared visions of, of research, of knowledge, of the need for disrupting the ways in which things are done in the conventional um, academy and the relationship between northern institutions and the institutions of the global south. I think the opportunities there to build not only intellectual exchange uh, between our academics and also our students, but also shared programmes where we are able to teach together, uh, shared scholarships that we can win together and work together on and other forms of sharing and for I've just been uh, in the fascinating um, panel on the archives thinking about our archive um, and about something that gave me goosebumps going down into the archive having come back to SOAS after many decades um, I was originally a student there um, with a group of students which included a South African student um, and students from British backgrounds in the UK and going in the, sh the shelves of the archives and finding in our archives um, a, a, an archive box that was from the village that the South African woman's grandmother had come from. And just thinking about what it would mean to open up that archive and, and to decolonize our own archive and take our decolonizing understandings into the materials of that archive and what had got preserved, but also what was being done with the things that had been preserved and our knowledge connections. So. The whole question of opening up that space, sharing that space, uh, doing projects together on decolonizing uh, the materials in that space. Um, and for our students, the powerful experience of being able to engage across between our institutions, um, asking those kinds of questions. Um, and I think this whole question about complicating our knowledge practices, it's been these last couple of days have been all about and thinking about what counts as knowledge and again, complicating and disrupting that question of what counts as knowledge building a shared critique of some of the ways in which knowledge about Africa, and I was very struck by the idea of 
a separate department of African studies that Siraj talks about in Germany, um, at, rather than having African historians um, studying history as it's cast, um, and then the extent to which the ways in which we study and speak about Africa re reproduce these kinds of uh, ways of thinking and doing, and how important it's been for us as an institution to look very um, self, you know, to look self-reflexively at our contribution to that, but also what needs to change. Um, building a shared critique of white saviorism and the problematic repercussions of development as they've wreaked their havoc in the countries that uh, we have been in and including um, Britain also as a place that has a lot of development challenges, which come from the ways in which empire has played out and its repercussions um, in our countries um, and the kind of structural adjustment ideas that have been visited in other countries coming now really to hurt us and to bite us also in the UK. So what we can learn from commonality around issues of social justice and the movements for social justice in our societies as movements of resistance. Um, and also the opportunities we have for going beyond the English language for all its colonial dominion and actually really starting to think differently about how we engage with languages and with frames of reference with concepts with meanings. Um, that are fundamentally um, coming from a very different view of the world and allowing us to see the world in different ways. Something that happened earlier this week on um, Mother Tongue Day uh, mother, um, was a, a, a new archiving platform was launched at SOAS from our Endangered Languages program, which included five new, 500 new collections with languages spoken in many communities, including in South Africa and Namibia, other countries in Southern Africa that are endangered and these records of local knowledge systems that are discovered and recorded by the holders of knowledge themselves in their own languages and just how important a part of it all uh, of the decolonizing project that is as well. Um, I think also part of this and it connects with this, um, you know, reversing the plunder of knowledge uh, of subordinate groups and this whole question then of restitution around those knowledge resources, which comes out of that. And the forms of practice that we have as researchers and the engagement practices as researchers, um, myself coming from a participatory research tradition of engaging those people around about who are usually studied in the process of studying for themselves and raising critical consciousness in the process. I think as Desiree Lewis put very powerfully in taking seriously the need to explicate and unravel these practices and to address the epistemological, the epistemic violence that visited through them. Um, and the very powerful uh, uh, contribution from um, the session with uh, Desiree and uh, we know, but also in the conversation before about patriarchy and about the effects of patriarchy and the colonial effects of patriarchy in all of our institutions. And the idea that we also need to depatriarchize the academy as well as decolonize it. Um, and we need, there are opportunities to work together. There's been so many interesting and important steps made in South Africa, so much contribution um, from South Africa on these discussions around the violence of patriarchy um, and around what can be done to, to make that change happen. How to really dismantle patriarchal privilege and patriarchal power in all of our spaces, including in the academy, in all pl places within the academy, both in our classrooms and in the way in which the academy is run. Um, and that is as much an urgent priority as the knowledge practices that are in what's being taught. Um, so it's about ending this commonality I, I hear in the conversations and the contributions over this uh, last couple of days about ending the practices that sustain colonial knowledge systems, actively disrupting them, and the ways in which we imagine what the academy is about and for. And with it then a very different kind of international partnership than some of those that have been pursued um, from the global north in the past. Uh, a partnership based on a mutuality, based on a co-equal relationship, based on a sharing of resources and knowledge resources and critical inquiry, and based also on honesty, on openness, on shared values, shared norms, and above all, uh, with that wonderful opening uh, that we had this morning from Francis Nanjo um, on conviviality and on making conviviality um, at the, the core of the heart of our practices of coming together um, in this, um, the international partnership that uh, we take forward from this and all of those different strands and dimensions of it. Um, and I think that idea of, in, of conviviality and of incompleteness and of the work that we can do in working with incompleteness um, is a really great way to incomplete um, my contribution at the end and to say again, thank you so much to everybody. Uh, it's been extraordinarily rich and uh, I very much look forward to future engagements of this kind. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. And now um, 
I pass the, the, the floor uh, to Brele uh, Bonile Molizzani, please. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here representing the um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of our college, Professor Antlantlam um, Kize. Um, but I won't say what he was going to say because I don't know what he was going to say. Um, so for me, I listened to um, the deliberations uh, in the last two days um, with, an e with an education ear because I'm a, an education scholar. And first of all, what struck me was how almost all of the presentations um, were, were, were asking us to think about um, the old question that was asked by Herbert Spencer many uh, centuries ago, what knowledge is of most worth? And to, to that qu question, who decides what knowledge is, is of most worth? It seems to me that what we continue to grapple with are those two related um, uh, questions. A, a, a second question um, that came to mind was um, what impacts do the inequalities that have been identified in the various uh, presentations, as well as the hegemonies? including the hegemony of English that um, Dr. Cornwell just spoke about. Even as we deliberate about the decolonization of knowledge, we do so in English. Um, mm -hmm. I would have loved to do this in Sesotho, but I know how far that would have gotten me. Um, so what impacts do these uh, inequalities and hegemonies um, uh, um, have? On, 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 the, on the knowledge that we generate as we decolonize. Um, thirdly, um, what is our responsibility as scholars in terms of ensuring that the people that we do our research on or about or with actually benefit from the research that we produce so in terms not only of generating knowledge and challenging the existing uh, knowledge canons, how do we communicate the knowledge that we generate so that it benefits the communities that we, we, we doing our research and generating um, knowledge um, about. So going forward for me, I think the challenge between our two institutions and the various institutions um, participating in these two days is how might our um, collective deliberations um, in this symposium and, be, and beyond, um, particularly in the context of the current um, health pandemic and future pandemics, um, as well as environmental uh, and conflict crises um, and emergencies. How do, how do we um, um, generate knowledge that will help us not only an anticipate um, um, those emergencies, but also ensure that the most marginalized people are heard and that their issues um, are, are, are addressed? So for me, those were the four questions that emerged. Uh, with those few words, I would like to also thank um, everybody who participated and to say on behalf of our university and college that we look forward to uh, future collaborations as we take these questions forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Perhaps um, the, the convener Wayne Doolin, um, Maesh Naidu, and Kai Isto would like to say a few final words before we, we say goodbye uh, to everybody. Unfortunately, we can't go for any drinks or any dinner or anything like that. It's a shame, but uh, we will. So perhaps uh, uh, just a few words by the, um, my fellow convener, uh, Wayne Doolin, and Kai, and Maesh. And also, I just want to thank everybody uh, for the fantastic symposium. Uh, let, let me start, uh, thank you Angelica, let me start by saying um, thanks of all, first of all to you of course for the enormous amount of work that you put into making this uh, symposium happen, I would have never kind of pulled it off without your enormous effort, so 
that's the first point. But the second point I want to make is really to thank uh, Mahesh for coming to us. I, I don't know if people, every, everybody present here today was here yesterday, but um, I did say yesterday that this initiative happened as a consequence of Mahesh coming to us. So, um, and, and you know, speaking to us about putting on uh, some collaborative event or at least starting a, a collaborative relationship um, now and into the future. So um, thank you to Mahesh and to colleagues at the University of KwaZulu Natal for, for making this happen. And, and of course, thank you to all of our participants and uh, members of the audience. That, that's really all I have to say. Uh, Maesh, do you want to say a few words? I think Kai was trying to, but oh, she had muted sorry, herself. I was, used, I was used to being off um, today. Um, no, I just wanted to echo Wayne, and and in a, you know, I think it's probably wrong to say it was easy. It was it was a lot of work for absolutely everybody, and especially um, Angelica and her team, and to do this during a pandemic uh, from so far away on new platforms. And yet it was organic in ways that are, you know, really inspiring to think about for future projects and the programming and all of the speakers that we asked to do different things and to, to respond to our prompts, but in their own way and on their own terms, it's just been absolutely fabulous to see. So I just want to thank all of our speakers and um, both UKZN and SARS for, for working so well together on this. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say ditto to um, to everything that uh, Kaya said. If you think two of me, it's not a clone, but I'm having to speak off one screen and, and be viewed on another. Um, and Kai, for a moment there, I thought you were going to say orgasmic, which, is, <laughs> which isn't too far from the truth, actually, because several of the things that we've heard here has been just purely intellectually orgasmic. So many things that I'm sure will resonate with you for days and weeks and months to come. So I want to also thank everybody, most especially Angelica. I think Angelica will just condense your name and, and contract it to Angel. <laughs> a little bit of a twist there because you have been phenomenal. And I want to also thank uh, uh, Prof. Jong for for supporting what we and I went to her with this was this what sounded like a crazy idea. I don't want to end by using too much of the words decolonial, decolonialism, but I want to speak more in terms of relationship and connection and in very human terms because really this has been an exercise in humanness, in connecting. And when I want to tease you a little, when I sat at that table, I came back thinking, mm, he's a hard nut to crack. <laughs> I thought that you were, were the least interested of the bunch where everybody else was so enthusiastic and you were grilling me and almost testing me about, so who's the expert here? Who do we connect here? And uh, of course, that was just you asking the right kind of hard questions. I am really, really heartened by the fact that this is exactly the kind of relationship, the kind of collaboration. When Andrea came, uh, spoke uh, and echoed what Vivian and I were talking about, I was more than thrilled because it's the kind of reciprocity, as an anthropologist, you know, that's an important word to us, the kind of reciprocity that we have been um, pining for. Yeah, in, in may, uh, many terms, because the uh, MOUs are so, they're so passe, they are so, you know, just tracked uh, in, in words and on text. And we were very keen that this was not going to be that kind of memorandum of relationship. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's still here and to say that I, I, this augurs, I think, for some incredible things in the future. Uh, along the lines that we have all collectively kind of envisioned in the context of what Ashil started, uh, started us off on, uh, beyond thinking of just the human, but human and humanity encompasses the entire planetary kind of consciousness. And I think for us to further collapse this illusion of separate and disconnected, which we can do via Zoom, but in, in, in other kinds of, beyond the intellectual as well, the emotional, sense, which I think we have managed managed across, I don't know how many thousand miles. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, I think we have to draw a close like this. Uh, unfortunately, it seems a little bit, you know, dry, but that's the nature. 
Uh, but thank you everybody again and uh, let's stay in touch and uh, more soon for everybody who's come to attend. We will um, hopefully, hopefully do more of these kind of events. Um, so thank you everybody and goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you bye. so much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you so much.